Now come along and listen to us talk with the Bon Jam. Go and have a lovely little walk with the Bon Jam. Let me put it on and go to bed with the Bon Jam. Or grab yourself a slice of toast and spread with the Bon Jam. Hello and welcome to Bon Jam with me, Simon Jeffrey, and I'm joined by the mmm to my mmm. It's Mr. James Turner. <laughs> I'm going to say that I've got the better mmm than, uh, than the other mmm. <laughs> What was Frederick Gray doing in this movie? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure we'll get grumpy. to that. That's what he was doing. So how are you, James? I'm good. Uh, we're going to go again, as always. Good, good. So we are doing For Your Eyes Only today. Yep. So first and foremost, James, could you do me a favour and describe the plot for me, please? Right, okay. I'm going to try this as eloquently as I can compared to the Moonraker one. So... We start with the reveal that the ATAC, which is like a special communication device for apparently telling some Marines when to fire the missiles and where and stuff like that, um, is hidden on a fishing trawler um, that's uh, that's out at sea at the time that we see it in the film. Um, and he, I mean, even though it's just like a front, it's just like a fake fishing trawler, uh, some of the people that work on there decide to take the role a little bit too seriously as a fake fisherman and actually do some fishing, and they end up catching a mine that, I think it's like an old World, World War II mine, that blows up the uh, the fishing trawler and obviously destroys this ATAC device that's on this trawler um, as well as. So the Ministry of Defence then requests a, a main archaeologist guy uh, called, um, I can't remember his first name now, a guy called Havelock. Um, Timothy. Timothy Havelock, thank you. Timothy Havelock to go and recover this device, um, but is then killed with his wife in front of his daughter, Melina. Um, and he's killed by this guy called Gonzalez, and Melina decides, right, I'm going to take revenge. Back with Bond, um, where he's tasked with finding out who killed Havelock and who is responsible for the killing. While investigating... Bond sees Gonzalez killed by Melina, which is just after Gonzalez is paid off by a mysterious man. Um, and Bond and Melina escape, and Bond discovers that the man who paid him off would be another guy called Locke. Uh, and later on, we find Bond is told from a guy um, called uh, Christatos that this Locke guy works for a, an organisation called The Dove, uh, who's headed by a guy called Columbo. So lots of names coming out here. Uh, as after numerous action scenes, uh, Bond is eventually told from Columbo himself that uh, Locke actually works for this Christatos guy. Um, and they uh, so they both find and kill Locke, which kind of confirms that um, Christatos was, uh, was behind it all. So now that Bond knows that Christatos is the main bad guy, he decides it's the time to actually you know recover the ATAC because they don't want the ATAC getting into the wrong hands. I don't know why they didn't do that before. But uh, he goes underwater with Melina, grabs the ATAC, but then Christatos steals the ATAC straight from him as soon as he recovers it. Um, so he goes and hides out in a mountaintop monastery, Christatos does, um, and he plans to sell it to the Russians, but Bond, Melina and Columbo and a few of his men then attack the base to try and stop him before he gives the ATAC to the Russians. The end. Yeah, very well done, James. Whew. You followed that plot with skill <laughs> and, uh, and concision. Yes. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do now, James, is introduce a new section to the podcast. Now, time will tell Ooh, yes. whether I've introduced this at the right point or not, but I'm going to put it in here. Okay. Um, oh, right. okay. Future episodes might have it at a different point if I decide it didn't work here. But this is going to be a bit of a trivia section where we can just start off by sharing a few contextualizing facts about the film that are not our own opinion, because sometimes I'll quote something as if it's my own opinion when really I've just watched the Bond special features <laughs> Blu-rays one too many times. Mm -hmm. And it always makes me cringe hearing myself pass off someone else's facts as my own a little bit. So this is a part of the show where we can unashamedly borrow other people's opinions and facts about the movie. So I'm going to call this For Your Facts Only. Oh, very nice. It won't always be called that, but time will tell. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing the octopusy version of that. So the very first fact is that For Your Eyes Only is the 12th film in the James Bond franchise, and it was released 
in 1981, around June, I believe, and it was directed by first-time director of the Bond films, John Glenn, who went on to direct um, a further four, I believe, That's right. after yeah, this. And interesting fact was that he directed every single Bond film of the 1980s. He did. And yeah. um, he had been a second unit director and editor prior to that and we'll get into that but i think this film you can really tell that there was a second unit director directing it uh, so do you have any facts for us james um yeah this was also the last appearance of alcohol man or whatever name you want to give him alcohol uh, who man. first appeared in the uh the spiral of me and then um in moonraker I, I was I, for a moment because I had another fact, which was that this is the first film in the series not to feature the character of M in any form in any oh, yes. uh, by yeah, any right, actor. Yeah. Um, uh, this was, of course, because of the real life passing of Bernard Lee um, after Moonraker, um, mm -hmm. and the producer did not want to rush to replace him, so they they waited a film before recasting. And, and the reason given in the film is that he's on leave. So I believe it's the only film to date in the Bond series that does not feature M. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly, Bond turns down Bibby uh, because of her age and things like that in the film, but there's actually only a three-year difference between Lynn Holly Johnson, who plays Bibby, uh, and Carol Bouquet, who plays Melina. Uh, so interesting. Yeah, and Carol Bouquet and Roger Moore, I believe in this film, have one of, if not the greatest age gaps mm. between a Bond and leading Bond woman of the series. But I think she is portrayed quite maturely, and we'll get into yeah, this. Yeah, I was going to say that. We're going yeah, yeah, yeah. to stray into uh, opinion yeah, I don't territory. Go into that. Yeah, that yeah. For your facts only, is no place for opinion. But uh, oh, so, Sorry, sorry. Yes, we'll, 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 we'll get into that. Yeah. Uh, we're finding our feet with this fact feature. Um <laughs> Okay, uh, another one then from me, which is that For Your Eyes Only was the eighth highest grossing film of 1981 in the US. Ooh. Above that, in the US, we had Chariots of Fire at number seven, Cannonball Run at number six. Also starring Roger Moore. Stripes at number five with Bill Murray. Um, the movie Arthur with Dudley Moore at four. So it's interesting that Bond was not top of the box office necessarily no, at this point no. in its history. And then at number three, we had Superman 2. At number two was On Golden Pond, which starred yeah, Catherine Hepburn and Henry Fonda, which was surprisingly successful. Um, not that it's not a well-regarded film. It's just uh, not necessarily the sort of film that you would expect to be second of the year these days. And, of course, ranked number one, highest-grossing movie of 1981 was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ah, of course. Yes. So Bond, several steps below the top contender of the year. Mm, yeah. So For Your Eyes Only is based or adapted from a couple of different Ian Fleming short stories, uh, For Your Eyes Only, and one called Risico as well. So the story involving Columbo, I think, is from uh, Risico and Fiora is only features a character called Judy Havelock, whose name was changed to Melina to reflect her part Greek ancestry. So oh, okay. in um, coming back down to earth, literally um, after Moonraker, they decided to revisit the novels and the short stories and take various elements from the bits they hadn't used yet to, to sort of aim for a more Fleming-esque feel yeah. and that was for your facts only yeah we have a jingle here uh, there's I mean, no don't I know, if you I say know. that i'll have to make one <laughs> so you touched upon the plot there james and you rightly began your description of the plot with the atac scene yes on the saint george's however mm -hmm. in doing so you skipped the pre-title sequence and i skipped that because it didn't really have much to do with you the skipped story. it of course because yeah. it wasn't really um, to do with the plot. And uh, so could you just briefly describe the events of the pre-title sequence, James? So the pre-title sequence opens up uh, with Bond visiting uh, Tracy's 
grave. So Tracy, as we know, uh, was Bond's wife in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Uh, so, you know, it is a uh, continuity is nice there. Touch. Nice yep. touch. Yeah. Uh, and then the priest comes along and goes, "Oh, Bond, there's a there's a helicopter that's sending. You need to go right away." So Bond jumps in the helicopter. Uh, the helicopter pilot is electrocuted through his headphones and is taken control of by a man in a wheelchair on top of a factory roof. The man in the wheelchair also happens to look a bit like uh, Ernst Stavro Blofeld uh, in his Donald Pleasance guys, or maybe yes. even the uh, the on a Majesty Secret Service look. I, I, the, we don't uh, know. We don't see his face. The website TVTropes.org describes that character as a lawyer friendly. Blofeld. A lawyer friendly. Now, do you know the story there? No. Oh, yeah, because they can't show his face because Kevin McClory yes. owned, the, um, owned the rights to Spectre and Blofeld. So for the for the listeners not familiar with this, the, the story goes way back to Thunderball. Um, perhaps this should have been in For Your Facts Only. <laughs> but Ian Fleming originally wrote the storyline for Thunderball with someone else. His co-writer at the time maintained that he deserved the rights to certain elements that they'd come up with together. And some of those were uh, some of the details in Spectre, some of the details in the character of Blofeld as well. Which is why we didn't get Spectre for many, many more years until the rights returned to the owners of the main franchise. But it was, in fact, why we also got the rival Bond film Never Say Never Again uh, two years after this. Mm. And so the producers of the Eon... Bond series said, you know what? We don't even need to say Blofeld. We don't need those copyrighted elements that you own. All we actually need to do is show a cat and a bald head and the audience will know who it is. Yeah. And yeah. so what we're going to do is we're going to bring this character back and throw him down a big chimney. <laughs> yeah. As if yeah. to say, you know that ace that you think you've got up your sleeve? We don't even need it. So it was a bit of a power play, I think, on the behalf of the, of the studio and the producers of this one to say, you know, screw you, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because the start of this film and the end as well as actually are probably the two silliest bits of the entire film. It, it, the rest of the film is quite grounded and not so ridiculous. Yes, I do still enjoy the sequence, but uh, oh yeah, yeah, it's not it's not my favourite part of the movie, but it's a fun opening. It's got some great helicopter work and some great stunt work on show. Um, yeah, I, I say it's a cool sequence, um, and that then leads into the uh, title sequence, which features Sheena Easton, which probably could have should have been mentioned in for your facts only. But uh, first time we see uh, the singer in the title sequence as well as yeah, it, it sort of plays more like a music video with that added in don't you think mm, yeah definitely yeah, yeah. but i i, I, I kind of liked it it's not something i would want to see in future title sequences but as a little one-off I, no i, I think it. um i think the producers and morris binder who designed the titles probably just thought that she had a particular look you know she was young and attractive and she would suit the bond series opening titles well what do you think of the song i like it i, I on my last viewing it sort of I was surprised how subdued it felt to begin with, but when the chorus comes in, it picks up. What do you think? Yeah, um, it was it was never one of my f- favourite songs, but uh, as time has gone on, I've become more... I, I like it more and more, actually. Um, yeah, as, as you say, as the chorus starts to kick in and stuff, it, it's... Um, yeah, I appreciate it as, it, as it as time goes on. So when we come out of the... Uh, pre-title uh, sequence and out of the opening titles we're on that yes. scene on the st george's and like you say the um the fishermen who are doing their job presumably just as cover or are you know or are the navy or whoever it is just kind of renting out some space down below <laughs> on a legitimate <laughs> vessel but i think it's interesting that it is just a complete accident it's not an act of terror no, but no. Uh, you do feel like God. That person with the winch really, really messed everything up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also feel like there should be that guy who uh, who's in Spy Love Me and Moonraker just on the also for all time say just going oh just just trust just the navy, a, sir. Just just the Royal Navy, sir. Yeah, 
<laughs> just, uh, just, just as a little cameo. Yeah, but it, but it quite, I find like there. scenes of uh, ship wreckages and stuff quite distressing. I think it's actually quite a, a dramatic. Uh, yeah, I think it's like a new actually. fear unlocked in me a little bit. It, yeah, I have. To, it has echoes of like the Devonshire scene in Tomorrow Never Dies, just that panic mm. as water starts gushing in and stuff. Yeah. And the idea of being handcuffed to your desk when that happens is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one story I wanna I wanna just briefly share from my childhood is that this next scene when we're in MI6 and Frederick Gray is at the desk and he has, I think, five different phones in front of him. Uh <laughs> And then someone comes in, and I'm not sure who he is, and they say, how deep was the water where St. George's sunk? And he says, not deep not enough, deep enough, I'm afraid. Yeah. And I remember watching this when I was younger, probably uh, 12 or 13. And we had guests around the house. We had some friends of my parents around to stay. And one of them was just um, briefly poking his head around the door and, and sat and watched this bit while I was watching it. And I turned and said, what did he mean then? Why does he say not deep enough? And I just remember him giving this explanation like, oh, well, because if it was deeper, then they wouldn't have to worry about anyone salvaging it because rescuers and divers can only dive so deep. So if it was really, really deep, then it would have been safe because it would have been too deep to, to recover. And he gave this really detailed, really clear explanation that has stuck <laughs> with me. And every time I've watched it since, I just think, ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you old friend um and, and gogol's told the same thing isn't he about the yeah he doesn't seem to care he's just too busy uh, flirting oh uh, yeah 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 what i found interesting is when bond does appear mi6 in a few scenes mm. time he's yes. told by is that tanner is it meant to be tanner the character it is tanner yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he's told by him five days ago the saint george's sank and I thought, for the first time, I thought, five days is a long time to wait before acting. Yes, yeah, It's a, yeah. it's a long time to do something, and they're worried about, if we're not careful, someone could, we could recover it. And why have you waited five days? But well, in actual fact, yeah. the, their first response to that was not to contact Bond, but it was to mm. contact uh, Timothy Havelock. Yes. Who was using his work on the temple in the area as cover, and it was only because he and his wife had gunned down that bond is called in to investigate that yes yeah, so his mission isn't to recover the attack it's actually to recover find out who's responsible for the killing it's it's um, interesting in a way that bond is not portrayed as mi6's only tool in these sort of scenarios and that actually yeah. they had it perfectly with in hand up until the point where the havelocks were murdered and then bond was called in to take over yeah um, so obviously Melina wants to take revenge. What I find um, interesting in that scene, because it cuts to Money Penny getting <laughs> ready in case Bond turns up, and she's got that little fold out mirror in her file drawer. Yes. Yeah, and then yeah. in the background, you know, she's putting on her lipstick, and then she sees a hat. Yeah, which we've not stand. seen since the uh, since George Lazenby. Not since uh, George Lazenby, uh, but yeah. interestingly, we've never actually seen Roger Moore wear a hat. No. Perhaps just by the 80s, the fashions had changed to the point where a hat would have been a little incongruous, perhaps. Yeah. Operation Undertow. The information's all here. Now, Gonzalez is at a villa near Madrid. Isolate him and apply the necessary pressure to find out who hired him. So we're at um, Operation Undertow, and he gets sent off to investigate uh, Hector Gonzalez at this... Yeah raunchy pool party thing that's going on uh, so, uh, yeah i don't know what's going on but um but yeah the, the song choice is uh is interesting yeah the lyrics of that song are filthy if yeah. you pay attention to <laughs> it <laughs> no, no 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 yeah i was decorating the other day and i was listening to it it's like oh my god what are you listening to james yeah i can't change the track i've got paint all over my hands <laughs> <laughs> speaking of like the cheesy 80s vibe to it and the 80s song what do you think about the music of this film because obviously the music is there to me is probably the most 80s sounding bond score yes um that there is but yeah i think it's amazing i love it 
Um, <laughs> it's by it's, Bill Conti, who yeah. who did, among other things, the Rocky music. And when when you say that, you can kind of tell. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure I'd want every Bond movie to sound like this, but I think the fact that it's just this one makes this one just have that extra something unique. It's got this unique sound to it. Yes, um, I think it's one of the most enjoyable soundtracks to listen to on its own as well. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, this pool sequence is really setting up Bond coming face-to-face with Melina and then uh, Bond's car gets destroyed, so it's setting up the, the Citroen 2CV chase. Yeah, and the idea was that they didn't want to rely on gadgets with the one with the more grounded um I think this is one of the, of the best film. car sequences in the entire Bond series. Yeah, it's so so much fun. Um yeah. it's fast paced as well, well put together. Um it's enjoyable. It's, yeah, really, it's really well shot and edited as well. Like you at no point do you ever not know where people are and where the geography is when they're driving down those like winding country roads. And it could just yeah. be a bit confusing because they keep going one way and turning around and coming the other. And Bond and Melina are driving kind of just straight down the hillside. And you know exactly what's happening. And it's just like a masterclass in stunt work and, and editing, I think, as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, but like you say, just not overly serious, but some incredible driving on the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, uh, like yeah. Remy Julien and, and, the, and the stunt team do some of their best work here and i don't think it's one of the most talked about car scenes in in the series i think the car is famous but i think people overlook just how good the driving is in the scenes. yeah 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 um, um speaking of gadgets we then go to uh the, uh, the Q's lab straight after that to find out the mysterious who the mysterious man was yeah that's part that's that's when frederick gray loses the ability to talk yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i always laugh at that scene why don't you try the identigraph? Mm. Yes, sir. Well, get cracking, 007. Mm. Minister. <laughs> he's but, just so I mean, grumpy. <laughs> Tanner's also grumpy. Um, he's not the same Tanner that we see in, like, Rory, uh, Rory Kinnear or, um, or Michael, Michael Kitchen, Kitchen later yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. It's not, not that no, it was a one-off face. appearance, it's, and it's sort of... It's probably easier to settle it in your head to kind of just go, oh, it's someone else some other stuffy yeah. old bloke <laughs> yeah i don't he's never referred to as tanner i think he's credited as tanner but yeah he's just he referred is. to as chief of staff isn't he so i like um, the identigraph scene as well it's proper well, spy it. work yeah. i mean it's it's fun and it's and it's it's not overly self-serious but it is so far i i yeah. love the identigraph sequence i just enjoy the the chemistry between q and bond in that scene a no um, not a banana <laughs> q <laughs> And then the fact that the Q lab is being shut down, so the, the lady being, I can't remember the name of the girl, but uh, she brings, up, brings in a yeah. cup of tea and she's like, oh, I'll lock up whatever your name is. Um, Sharon, I think. Sharon, yeah, that's it, yeah. yeah. Um, there's, a scene, so there's a scene where uh, they've identified who it is and Bond is telling Tanner over the radio, I guess, or the phone. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, Q's just sort of sat listening. But Desmond Llewellyn looks just zoned out. He's just staring at the camera the whole time. <laughs> I've not seen that after. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't notice it when I watched it. I watched it last time. I um, I mean, I don't know if you've ever made a computer... Well, I know you probably have. Um, but when you make a computer game character, when you make you can customise your character and make it look like whatever. I'm always trying to make it look like myself or a certain person. Yeah. Rubbish at it. Yes, yeah, this identicraft machine does it spot on. It's uh, It's amazing how... Accurate, just yeah. a few little details. He have to give uh, it makes him look like clock. He doesn't have to give it many details for it to almost immediately become the person. <laughs> yeah, no, just no. male, Caucasian, late thirties, hair light brown, part it in the middle, and then like some of the details, you're like, how did you get that? How did you see his eye color from where you were? <laughs> how, did, <laughs> yeah. how did you stop long enough to figure that his lips were fuller, or, or you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or that his glasses um, were octagonal. Yeah, well, but I love I love that sequence. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I could do with your help um, answering, or at least your understanding of a scene that follows. Okay. So Bond goes to uh, somewhere. Poutine. In, 
Cortina. Cortina. Yeah, Cortina. Somewhere where there are mountains and skiing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, he goes into a hotel. Yes. And he turns on the taps immediately and then just leaves the room. Mm-hmm. And then when he comes back... The thing, writing's on the, the... The writing's on the mirror. What, yes. What's happened there? Uh, my understanding... Uh, I mean, as a kid, I used to go. Used to, used to what, what did what did it say that on that mirror? It um, said Tofana, ten a.m. Yeah, I used to always think as a kid that it used to say Tofana, Iom. I I thought it said Iom for ages. Yeah, Iom. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, it's ten a.m. Right, okay. But yeah, I, my my understanding is that um, somebody's been in a shower previously and then written that, and the, someone's not cleaning the mirror, and it's still stuck there. Right. So when the water, <clears throat> water when the condensation happens, it's still got the remnants of whatever somebody did the previous time. Because uh, as I understood it, that must have been Luigi. Yes. Yeah, and it yeah, must yeah. have been deliberate, right? It yeah. wasn't just him writing down a note to remind himself. I think that was some kind of prearranged, I'll let you know the meeting place by doing it this way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I would say up until last night's viewing, I had always been interpreting that in a way that I'm suddenly not sure is correct. I would say Mm. up until last night, I had always assumed that in the time that Bond was out of the room, someone snuck in and did that. Oh, okay. And it was only last night that I watched it and thought, no, if you steam up a mirror and someone has sort of drawn on it in wax or even with their finger yeah it will reveal something that's been previously written yes yeah yeah and that made a lot more sense <laughs> it's like when so you you've always been under the, under the impression that someone sneaks in up until in yesterday yeah. yeah i oh, was right. up into the okay. impression uh, under the impression that L- luigi had probably snuck in and quickly written that on the mirror and ran out he's which a master would, ninja <laughs> should make no sense but yeah that that makes a lot more sense that he would have just He'd have said, when you get to your ho- hotel room, turn on the water and the That's message will be on yeah. the glass. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's always been my understanding anyway. Yes. So then he goes to the ski slope and uh, and the ice rink, meets with yep. Luigi. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we've given Luigi a hard time over the years because uh, because of his status as a sacrificial lamb in many lists and things that and rankings we've talked about actually i don't think he's a bad ally at all he's actually quite no. helpful he's really helpful and he'll do anything for it. he's like oh do this and he'll do it. okay yeah and he'll i'll meet you wherever okay um it's like he, he, like he just dismisses luigi and he's like okay um yeah he's quite happy, happy to help i'm still yeah, i'm yeah. still kind of confused as to the bb subplot and why she's there like she needs a sponsor. That's what um, Jacoba Brink says later on. Mm, yeah. So is it just that she's paired up with this rich guy who's funding her training? It, but is there is there it, more to it than that? Is is there a relationship like a, an actual? She calls him Uncle, Uncle Larry. Uncle Larry. So I, is is that is that? A, is that, is that just when you say you're like an uncle's an uncle when it's not really, you know, technically related? But are they related? I mean, I didn't understand if there, there was a... No, I don't think it's a blood relation. I think... Because no. um, he just introduced her as my, my protégé. Yes, um, yeah. I, I Maybe, I, th- I think perhaps it's all just part of his cover to, to present himself as a virtuous, charitable person. Because he's quite sort of yes. public facing, he's quite well known, and his government gave him the king's medal. Yes. Um, so if he so, can... you know, he's, he's always trying to keep up appearances. Yeah. So someone who's received the king's medal from from the UK and maybe part of his outgoing appearance is this appearance of charity and uh, funding this would be Olympian someday is all part of that. I can't quite see the benefit that she brings other than maybe just solidifying that as cover, but um, yeah, yeah, it's all a bit strange. I am really, really thankful that this movie downplays a lot of the seediness of previous Roger Moore outings 
and it's yes, it's, it's quite yeah. like desexualized for most of the film. Bond is on a mission and he's focused on the mission throughout. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think so. I think times have changed by this point. In the movie. Yeah, and I think even t- time. even two years earlier in Moonraker, Bond would have been focused on the mission, but very much open to some distractions along the way. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually really refreshing to see the film stay on focus and and particularly with the age and the sort of immaturity with which BB is played. I find yes. myself every time just relieved with how they handle it. Yeah, because I think if she was um, somebody that Bond got together with, I probably would hate Bibby quite a lot. Um, but she's done in a certain way that she's meant to be a bit immature. She's meant to be a bit. Uh, she's meant to be young. She's meant to be immature, and it, it is done tastefully. I think. Personally. Yeah. So Bond meets with Melina again because she's been tricked into turning up there. I feel like that was a line that was just completely like forgotten about where she says, oh, I got your telegram. It's like, I didn't send a telegram. Yeah, what um, was the purpose of bringing her there? To kill her, I guess. Was Yeah. Is, I just feel like there are more effective ways of killing someone than just waiting for them on a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, oh, is, is this, was this a plot point that's going to be revealed later on? It's like, oh, that person sent the telegram. But no, no, it's just, she just was a target for death uh, I, I don't know um has roger moore ever looked better than he does on that sleigh to be honest I, I yeah i mean i think he looks good in a lot of this film um i just think he's really good in that i think he's just really like the acting is just it's like someone said to roger um you know what we'd want to keep this one a bit more serious and and and, and have a bit more sincere moments from you and he was like yes thank god of course you know because <laughs> he really shows a little hint of what he could have been capable of doing far more of yeah um, i agree but i just think roger is brilliant in that scene yeah i agree yeah. um so bond gets back to his hotel and finds bb waiting for him and this is again as i said one of those scenes where i'm just grateful that they handle it like they do, and they get some humour out of Bond acknowledging that she is far too young. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's, um, not, she's not a kid, but he's just like, I'll buy you an ice cream. It's just like, I know. Yeah, Jesus yeah. Christ, girl. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great line. <laughs> uh, they, they sure do get their use out of the winter setting, and they basically throw every type of winter sports-based action scene that they can think of at us in this film yes yeah i think there might be one too many and like yes, little, little short hockey. vignette sections where it's like oh you know let's do the biathlon where he's got the skiing and the shooting and then that turns into a yeah, little short yeah. shooting section i think the ice hockey bit is is a little one one too many for me <laughs> yeah it's cut down as well that scene yeah i watched yeah. the uh, deleted scenes uh yeah. yesterday um so then he, he sort of evades Kriegler. Mm-hmm. He's just like an Olympian skier who who somehow gets out skied by Bond. Yes. And keeps yeah, falling yeah. off his skis. <laughs> uh, it's almost like to say that Bond is the best, no matter what sport it is, Bond's always going to be the best. But uh, yeah, this is where we get introduced to Charles Dance as well. Yeah, and I love that scene where he's in the ski jump um, thing. The, Up on the, the ski the, slope. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they go in the lift and, you know, then he notices the, the dove and it's it's quite tense. It's like yeah. it's, the music's like changes completely compared to what the music was before. Um, I like and... that Bond doesn't really seem to have much of a plan. No. He, yeah. yeah, and, he, yeah. and he gets to the top and he tries to turn back and he's like, oh, uh, I'm stuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is quite tense. And then that obviously blasts its way into a more traditional action sequence. There's a brilliant, like, amazing bit of skiing in this scene. Oh, yeah. Where yeah, Bond yeah. comes speeding past on the skis, and there's, like, a line of people being taught to ski by an instructor by the looks of things. And they do the, high, the kind of classic Bond domino fall, where they all fall over. But Bond, like, skis over the instructor's skis. He comes through so quick, and he skis so close to him. It's it's just incredible. Yeah. Um, and like skiing down the bobsleigh track and over the table and down the hill. It's just the stunt work in this film is incredible. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and Creedless yeah. throws, a, throws a motorbike at him. <laughs> yeah, for, it's like you're not getting anywhere with that, are you? Um, <laughs> you could still run and catch him from where you are. <laughs> I know, yeah, because Bond's still putting his, getting his skis ready and getting yeah. he fell over as well, didn't he? So it's like. He's just like your typical blonde, typical blonde-haired henchman. Yeah, they keep having these scenes pop up where someone looks like they w- might be about to make an attempt on Bond's life, but then you take one look at the the hench person or the thug or whoever it is, and you think you're not going to be the one to kill Bond. Yeah, like yeah, later yeah. on, the guy who pilots that submarine that attacks them. Oh, like, no, no, yeah, I, yeah. I would be scared that Bond <laughs> might meet his meet his end, but. If he is going to die, it's not going to be you that does it, is it? Yeah, yeah, no. I like the uh, the mutual respect that Bond and Melina have, you know, when they're going through the town talking about yeah, what they've quite picked nice, up yeah. and they're buying fruit and watching those weird dances and stuff. Yeah. yeah I was yeah. slightly distracted by her dubbing, I have to say. Because when I watch, like, the deleted scenes in the trailers... I can't quite figure out why they felt they needed to dub her at all, but um, only in recent years have have I really picked up on that. Yeah. Whoops. (laughs) Me night is slipping. So is your accent, can't What exactly uh, is Liesl's point in this whole thing? Sacrificial lamb again, I guess. Um... I can't figure out what would make the producers, the writers say... Um, let's have this character in here for a scene or two. Other than mm. she's sort of portrayed as Columbo's mistress and she flashes something at Bond. Is it a room number or something? When when she, Which leaves Columbo. Columbo and her have that little public Arguing. spat yeah, yeah. and that seems quite staged. Was the argument even real in the first place? I don't think so. In terms of like, was she in on it as well as I? Because I used to watch it and go... Oh, Columbo has said something horrible. No, no, I think she. I think he got back to his table, and then said something like, "Get angry with me and throw your drink over me." Okay, got you right. Yeah, That's yeah. how it always came across to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I wasn't ever sure why she was in the film, other than to give Bond another woman. Maybe, mm. maybe that really was it from the filmmaker's point of view. We're gonna hold off this romance between. Bond and Melina, but we can't have Bond go without anyone the entire film. <laughs> Let's yeah. hook him up with someone else in the meantime. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was Cassandra Harris. Yep, Pierce Brosnan's wife. Mrs. Pierce Brosnan, um, who I'm sure was a big reason behind the producers getting to know of Brosnan was him visiting the set. Yes, yeah, yeah. So who knows what would have happened if they hadn't put that character in there and cast it as they had. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? So Bond realizes in the next scene that Columbo is perhaps not the bad guy Christatus has been portraying him as. Mm-hmm. And, yep. uh, you know, they form a kind of uneasy friendship at first, as if to say, I'll trust you for now. Let's see how this goes. Um, and then we have the scene where they infiltrate that little warehouse and Locke gets away after blowing it up. Yeah. And Bond uh, just runs after him up all those steps. It's, it's a great scene, though. Um, I love it. This is this is like proper Bond stuff when, like, Roger... I know Roger Moore himself suggested maybe that the, the pin is enough to topple the car off the cliff, but... They the were right. Is, they were right yeah. to say now. I think it needs needs to be more definitive. I think you need to boot it off, and that's one of my favourite moments. It's oh, just yeah. Roger's yeah. face. <laughs> yeah. um, so when we go to the, um, we go back to that temple, and Bond meets up with Melina underwater. And I remember, yes. I remember reading somewhere that, uh, or hearing somewhere that Carol Bouquet had trouble diving, or she couldn't be underwater. Yeah, yeah. That's and I mean. that all of the scenes with the close ups of them are filmed dry for wet. Yes. So, yeah, so on a sound stage with wind machines and all the bubbles are optically composited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I, I was watching it with that knowledge and I just still couldn't quite believe it. I was like, if those bubbles are added in, they are added in really well. Yeah, I agree. I Because I, I've known this fact for quite a while and... 
I, I've, I've never gone, oh, yeah, you can tell now. Yeah, you can see uh, at times, you know, the hair does look like it's slow motion in a wind machine. Mm. But never to the point of breaking belief in, in the scene. And yeah. it's merged so seamlessly with the, the footage of actual, the actual divers yeah, yeah. actually in the water. Yeah, it's, it's really impressive, that. I really enjoy the scenes where Bond and Melina are just kind of working together to crack the case of what's happened and reading her dad's diaries and translating the shorthand. Investigative work. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sort of maybe pace sags a little bit in the submarine bits, but I think that's just with how long the scene takes to kind of come together. Yes, but... uh, it, it does take too long because once they've got rid of the big guy in the suit, once they've got rid of him, then the other submarine comes. It's just like, it was probably one too, it was just one too many. Just one of those things would have been enough. Yeah. I like um, I like the investigation stuff more than I like the action stuff or the bits with the yeah. the guy in the, the, the suit or the other submarine. But mm. I, do, I do find it funny that Bond steps out of the sub and then immediately says, conserve your oxygen supply, speak only when necessary. Yeah. And I just thought, yeah, you could have said that before you got out. <laughs> and then that's true. Then yeah. he proceeds to just read everything out loud that he's reading on the instructions. So he's like, <laughs> I passed this by routing this wire through this. <laughs> read it in your head, Bond. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I like the scene where he like, like, dragged through the water and how dismissive. Christathos is of his his own guy who falls in. Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, the, the sharks have them. The bond is cut up and the sharks are circulating him and Melina. And then one of his crew falls off. And the sharks immediately ignore the bloody clump of human that they're right next to. And just go, <laughs> Ooh, an evil person. <laughs> and he's like, nah, leave him. <laughs> what I, what I do just, you think of Christathos as a villain anyway? We've not really discussed him him really i like that it's sort of played ambiguous to begin with as to who the real villain is and i think you can only do that if you don't go too big with the performance Mm. so you have to portray him as quite calm and charming to start with i think that you're always in danger if you do that of getting criticized by some in the bond community you know that would that would say that he's one of the weaker villains because he's not classically evil or menacing or he's got no physical presence or mm. or whatever but i think in in the nat- with the nature of this story it has to be done that way i think i think you're right i think he's he falls into a category where you've got your, your, your typical bond villains but you've also got your grounded bond villains and he definitely falls under that grounded bond villains along with yeah you know like koskov and things like that yeah and i think um the the stakes of the plot come from what it is they're trying to do more than how evil and menacing this guy is he's not overly scary he's not particularly physically imposing but you still think yeah this is a proper bond villain because he's threatening nuclear war essentially or you know or at the very least he's enabling it this is a plot worthy of the double o section you know sometimes you get a villain with a kind of smaller scale plot and you think does this really warrant mi6's best could this not be done by local police you know <laughs> yeah but from that perspective i think the villain and his plot are more than enough to justify bond's presence there and his involvement in it and um and because he's played the way he is you're able to actually buy into the fact that he could be an ally to begin with some films you watch it and before the villains even really met the hero you think hmm, I wonder if this person's going to be the bad guy or not, because it's yeah. so obvious. And I don't think you get that here. I think it is... It's not like Hugo Drax in Moonraker, where yeah, exactly. yeah, you, 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 he is the villain. Uh, and I think you get a sense throughout this film that they are really making a, de- a decided effort to do that as well. It's not an accident. It's every choice they've made is on purpose mm. here to um, to really aim for that more grounded approach. Yeah, 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 definitely. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. That's putting it mildly, 007. We'll briefly skim past Q dressed as a priest. (laughs) (laughs) The only thing I question there is how many 
genuine confessions did he listen to before Bond <sighs> arrived? Yeah. And what's the uh, what's yeah. the moral code there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's a fun little moment to uh to get them on their way i i love this saint cyril's sequence i mean it's amazing yeah i mean when you think about the very last bond movie we saw was a movie where he was going up into space with lasers and stuff and then this movie deliberately slows the pace right down to the level of right here's some rope and a hammer and some <laughs> pitons or whatever it it really takes its time to do a, a grounded adventure and, yeah uh, and that the, the stunt like in that where the bad guy catches him and he kicks him off and he falls down you, you see it was rick sylvester from spy love me who did the stunt yeah the, the same guy who did the ski jump at the, the ski beginning. jump yeah yeah but that is you know we think about all the classic bond stunts you know the, the ski jump and or the barrel roll and things like this is i think this is a really underrated oh god stunt. yeah no i was i watched it last night and just I, and it's just, just imagined it happening and it's yeah like, oh, God. that's not a dummy that's natural guy falling and nobody ever really talks about this as being I feel their, like uh, these days you only get talked about if it's the actual star doing the stunt themselves these days yeah, yeah 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 and obviously it's not roger moore doing that so it doesn't get mentioned in the same breath as say tom cruise doing all his own stunts in mission impossible but i just think this is up there if it had been tom cruise doing it you'd be like, holy crap, he fell yeah, like yeah. 300 feet mm, yeah, to yeah, the end yeah. of a rope. That's terrifying. Um, yeah. And just just really, really solidly put together adventure style action where it all makes absolute perfect sense. He's got to climb up there, lower the basket for them all to get up and there's real sort of tension and real... Yeah. Real yeah, just yeah. kind of nuts and bolts kind of adventure stuff. Like it doesn't need gimmicks and gadgets and high tech stuff and it's sort of I don't know, it's like a breath of fresh air, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um yeah, it's just so cool. Yeah, I'd say there's a bit of a sagging part up in, in this bit where the villains just seem to be waiting around, which is exactly what they are doing, but the way in which, say, Kriegler is dispatched is a little perfunctory, and uh, yeah, I would have, I would have liked a, a better death. Uh, you know, once we're up, up there, yeah. you know, getting up to the top in the monastery is is brilliant. But I think once they're there, it's essentially just waiting for Gogol to land. Yes, and yeah, yeah. a few middle-aged men slugging it out for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. And finally, Christatos is then dispatched by um, by Columbo. By Columbo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the film ends there. Yeah, well, sort of. Not exactly, but well, well, the film doesn't end yet. I mean, no, no. There's still the highlight of the film to come yet, James. <laughs> where, uh, as per tradition in Roger Moore's movies, where um, you know there's a bit of a romantic scene developing, and MI6. Um, interrupt you know rather than patching into the space shuttle straight to the white house uh like they did in moonraker it's they give him a bit of notice we're gonna put margaret thatcher on the line which <laughs> is a really odd thing to include in a bond movie if you think about it because the bond yeah, movies actual, typically uh... strayed away from you know dating themselves to a, a, an exact year in time yeah but the 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 actress was known as a Margaret Thatcher impressionist yes, yeah, in yeah, other yeah. stuff. So it feels a little bit like having, say, John Coulshaw playing Tony Blair in a Brosnan movie or something. It, I feel yeah. like that would really pull you out of it these days. Yes, I agree. Um, and maybe it, it did I mean, at the time, but I've sort of just learned to accept it now. Well, that's it. I feel like, as I said before, it kind of... It's, Top and tails, two silly things that happen at the start and end of the film. All the middle bit of that film is is very much more serious and more grounded. You know, my favourite part of this scene was yesterday, and I don't think I'd fully noticed it uh, up until then. But if you look when Maggie is thanking Bond for his service, yes, how happy Frederick Gray looks. <laughs> he looks yeah, so yeah. so excited <laughs> that the prime minister is is pleased. 
He's <laughs> happiest he's ever been in this film. Yeah. He's like a little kid. Yeah. Um, then, oh, then, then the realisation. I finished the film with a smile, James. Whatever you may think about the silliness of the scene. You know what? Yeah, same here. Same here. I like how... Um, how he, <laughs> did he call Q an idiot or something like that? Yes. Um, <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> as if it's Q's fault. <laughs> Yeah, this fact that the parrot is like, bon, bon, yeah. he's there. Yeah. <laughs> like, they can't tell the difference between Roger Moore's voice and that of a parrot. Oh, dear. And then they go for their moonlight swim, and James Bond will return in Octopussy, mm. which, of course, he did. Yeah, they got it right this time. Yes. So that was, for your eyes only, James, uh, high point, low point, conclusion for you? Um, for me, um, for, for your eyes only, has climbed its way up my favourite Bond films all the time, and it's got to the got to the very top. Spy Love Me is also up there, but for me, for your eyes only, is is one of my favourite Bond films of all time. Um, it's probably the, the most underrated Bond film, I think. And for a high point for me, uh, would be the Saint Cyril's climb. Uh, with Clumbo, I think. What about yours? Uh, I agree. I think over over the years, it's really risen up the ranks. It was never low to begin with, but I think I've just really grown to appreciate it more and more mm. as I've got older. And I think with The Spy Who Loved Me, I think if I were to show someone a Bond movie because they'd watched one or two of maybe Connery's and they wanted to see that you know, the classic formula at its most memorable, all the, you know, the moments people talk about, oh, I, I've heard of Jaws. Isn't there one where he skis off? A, I might show them Spy Love Me in that instance. But, yes. you know, for someone less familiar with the series who said to me, like, I like good movies. <laughs> what shall I watch? I'd say, well, if you like good movies and you want to watch one of Roger Moore's and you're not overly fussed, or nostalgic about the Bond elements of them. Because if you showed someone these days without that sort of predisposition for anything Bond, if you showed them The Spy Love Me or Moonraker, they might just go, oh, he's such a sleazeball, you know? I'd say watch for your eyes only then. It, yeah. It's maybe one of the less famous of his outings. It doesn't have the Union Jack parachutes and and all the most memorable parts that you might know, but I think it's one of his best performances yeah. in a film that I think has very, very few weak parts. I, I agree. I think uh, if I, I were I, to I, pick I, low parts, I don't know. I mean, Margaret Thatcher is silly. And beyond yeah. that, it's really just, well, you know, it sags a little bit in the casino with Liesel and Bunky and all that stuff, I guess. <laughs> just starts to slow down a little bit but it's consistent i think it's one of the most consistently good movies throughout yeah i think i would agree with you, you on the low points there's not many i could think of uh and i would probably agree with the points that you said but you, you don't see this film at the top of many other people's lists. i've never you know when you see other lists on the online and things like that you never really see for your eyes only up there and i yeah. don't understand why i don't understand um that. I think it's too um, easy to forget, perhaps, and people just kind of go, oh, yeah, that exists too. Uh, well, I'll put it somewhere in the middle. It's, yeah, or <clears> it doesn't have that classic moment that all the other films have in it. But. but like you say, I think some of the stunts are some of the most underrated stunts of the series. I think yeah. some of the driving is some of the best driving of the series. And the falling from the cliff stunt is one of the most scary-looking stunts of the series. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. got some of his best acting of the series. And one of the more convincing, tender relationships between Roger Moore's Bond and any of his leading ladies as well. Yeah. So No, I agree. I know it's not it's not at the top of many people's list, but I, I cannot explain why. Because to me, this is very close to my all-time favourite, I think. Yep, yep, same. Let's play games with James. Please with James. So James, I was looking back through my list of games with James that I've done on previous episodes, and I could have sworn I'd done this one already. And what I realised is that it wasn't actually on this podcast. 
I've done a similar quiz with you pre Bond Jam. Oh, really? So I'm hoping that these aren't all too uh, too much of a repeat of that. But if you remember, there was a time many many years ago where you came to visit me in my flat and mm. we did some trivia. We may have even been live streaming on Facebook at the time to nobody, but <laughs> uh, I, I I did a quiz with you based on Bond's first lines. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I think we've I do done. That. Yeah. On Games with Janes, we've done Bond girls' first lines, and we've done Bond villain final lines. Yes. But we have yes. not done Bond's first lines. Okay, that's why I was just familiar. Yeah, I thought we'd done it on Bond Jam, but yeah, it wasn't Bond himself. But okay. we have done this, uh, a version of this, pre-Bond Jam. Okay. So I'm going to do a bit of a twist on it, and I've broken these up into what I think are easy, medium, and hard categories. Ooh. So the first three will be what I consider easy. So that's prime opportunity to embarrass yourself. Um, the next four are, let's say, medium difficulty. And the final six, because I couldn't be bothered to narrow it down beyond 13, are difficult. So for the easy and the medium category, what I will do is I will read you the quote and you tell me for which film this is Bond's first line. Okay. For the hard category, I will tell you the film. And oh, you cool. tell me what Bond's first line in that film is. Okay. Okay. Now, I mean, I will be lenient to some Tough. degree. If you say, oh, it's something like this, then okay. I, I, might, I might be willing to accept it. I won't as long as it's something similar. Yes, I, I won't give you uh, long enough to watch the film to find these out, though. I will have to push you for an answer. Uh, I can't after, go on Google or anything like that in the time. Right, okay. Uh, well, I would, I'd like to think that you don't regularly go on Google anyway, James. This, it's not in the spirit of games. No, James. I never do that. Well, as you can see, I always, I've never got a full, uh, a full score anyway. So that could all be part of your deception, though. You know. Yeah, yeah. For whatever reason. <laughs> All right, so what I will need to begin with, James, is a sound from you to play in the event that you get one of these correct. Uh, I'm going to go, I intend to enjoy it to the full. Lovely. That was that, that was man in wheelchair. Yep. Blofeld. No felt. <laughs> no um, felt. <laughs> and can I have a sound from you for if you get any of these incorrect? Well, I was going to go with, I don't know if we can do this, but the sound that that girl makes when uh, Locke's henchman just takes the money off her. Oh, I want so you to try. It's like a ha-ha, like that. <laughs> that is not the not, sound. No, no. Yeah, you're just, you're just going to use me. You're not, not going to use the sound. You can give me an alternative if you want, James, but I'm just going to use that now. Okay, right. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is Bond's first line quiz. And here we are with question number one in the easy section. His first line is, This never happened to the other fella. Oh, I wonder what that could be. Uh, that's Honor Majesty's Secret Service. I intend to enjoy it to the full. That is correct, James. Well done. This never happened to the other fella. You could get a clean sweep this time. I can feel it. Are you ready for the next one? No. Yeah, go for it. M doesn't mind you earning a little money on the side, Dryden. That is Casino Royale. I intend to enjoy it to the full. She'd just prefer it if it wasn't We're selling, selling secrets. secrets. Em really doesn't mind you earning a little money on the side, Dryden. She'd just prefer it if it wasn't selling secrets. And finally. I say finally, it's not. I mean, you might find it's finally some, easy one. You might find the, the next one's just as easy, but I've arbitrarily decided that this is the last easy one. Yeah, <clears throat> well, uh, as long as I get these right, at least I'm, I'm satisfied. Beg your pardon? Forgot to knock. <laughs> That's Goldeneye. I intend to enjoy it to the full. Yes, it is. Well done, James. Beg your pardon. Forgot to knock. <gasps> so far, so good. Number yes. four. Let me try and enlarge your vocabulary. That is uh, the spiral of me. I intend to enjoy it to the full. That is correct. Oh, James. I cannot find the words. Well, let me try and enlarge your vocabulary. I think I think we're on a roll there. I think we can get all these. 
Did you hear that, everybody? <laughs> He's going to get all of these. Let's see. Number five. Relax, Felix. Oh, God. Um, it's uh, License to Kill. I intend to enjoy it to the full. That is License to Kill. Yes, well done. Now, you're sure you've got the ring? Relax, Felix. This could all be over very quickly. Number six. Where is he? Where is he? As uh, Diamonds Are Forever. I intend to enjoy it to the full. That is Diamonds Are Forever. Yes. Well done. I may have made this too easy. Where is he? <gasps> okay. Uh, number seven. I couldn't agree with him more. Oh, God. Um... Uh, is it from Russia with Love? I intend to enjoy it to the full. That is from Russia with Love. <sighs> I thought oh my that, god, that was, that was close. I thought that might be the point at which you, yeah. uh, you oh, fell. Okay. Yeah. I said, it's great sport, this punting. I couldn't agree with him more. <sighs> okay, so the, the final section of this, the last six I'm going to give you, I'm just going to give you the name of the film. Okay. So can you tell me Bond's first line in... Quantum of Solace. Quantum of Solace. Is it time to get out? I intend to enjoy it to the full. It is time to get out. Yeah. Yes, well done. Come on. It's time to get out. Come on, keep it up. I'm rooting for you now. <laughs> Can you tell me Bond's first line in Die Another Day? Um, it's, it's, it's when he leaves the uh, the helicopter. It's like... Um, Van Beer. Uh, I'm gonna have to push you for an answer, James. Uh, I can't remember his line. Oh my god, I, sh I should know this. Um, uh, oh my god, my god, he, <laughs> he, he's gonna have to buzz me for time. I'm gonna, time. We, we're gonna get yeah. to hear that noise at last. So look on the bright side. <laughs> <laughs> well, bad luck, James. The correct answer is me too. My African military friends owe you many thanks, Colonel Moon. I've been looking forward to this meeting. Me too. My African military friends owe you many thanks, Colonel Moon. Mm -hmm. I, I should have known that. I should have known it. I still think if you end up with 12 out of 13, that's very good. Okay, number 10. Can you tell me Bond's first line in Dr. No? See, many people would go, it's Bond, James Bond, but it's not because he says something in terms of playing the cards and I don't know what that line is um, it'll be a card line it could be a card line it most likely will be a card line but I'm just going to go I my old look miss <laughs> oh James I'm not sure I can give you that the, the answer is I admire your courage miss <sighs> I admire your courage miss uh... Trench Sylvia Trench yeah no you can't give me that no, it's not that, cl not yeah. close enough. Yeah, God's sake. Uh, never mind. But, so it's not a card line. It's not like hit me hole. Like, no. Uh, no. Oh, right. Okay. I thought it'd be like uh, or cart or whatever. No, he doesn't say card. anything no. until then. Okay. Can you tell me Bond's first lines in the Man with a Golden Gun? So he doesn't appear in the pre-title sequence. So. Um. Is it when he comes into his office? Oh my god. I, I might not actually know this one. I'm just going to go with uh, The Man with the Golden Gun. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Do you know who Francisco Scaramanga is? Oh yes, The Man with the Golden Gun. I know the line you're referring to, James. Yeah, yeah. But before that, yeah, go on. he says, Good morning, sir. I did say <laughs> sir at the start. Oh, for <laughs> sake. Good morning, sir. I yeah. put that in to be tricky. Okay, number 12. Can you tell me Bond's first line in The Living Daylights? Ooh. I need to use your phone. I intend to enjoy it to the full. That is correct, James. Well oh, done. Yes. I need to use your phone. Number 13. Oh, there was another one. Right, okay. No, I, for some reason I've done 13 in this round. Right. Can you tell me Bond's first line in You Only Live Twice? God, uh, I don't think I can without it sounding completely off. Um, I, I want you to try. 
Um, it's something about like how Japanese girls taste differently to other girls. Is that right? Oh, he's not is in that... Japan at that point. <laughs> oh, he's not in Japan. No, uh, he's in Hong Kong at that point. Okay. Um, is it something really bad like that? <laughs> it's just something I wanted to get you to say, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, what's your guess? It, I'm going to go with... Uh, why do Chinese girls taste differently to other girls? I don't know. I intend to enjoy it to the full. I'm going to give you that, James. Well done. Really? <laughs> yes. His first line, and you only live twice, is why do Chinese girls taste different from all other girls? Yeah. Why do Chinese girls taste different from all other girls? Well done, James. You got 10 out of 13, I believe. Okay. I will just let text-to-speech person confirm that for me. Yes. James did get 10 out of 13. whoop de doo So what? I'm getting pretty sick of repeating his inadequacies, to be honest. If he doesn't get a clean sweep soon, I'm going to walk. No cap. I think she should have a bit more gratitude, considering I got so many right. Yeah, it was rather ungracious of her, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't like that. There we go. That was Games with James. Well done, James. Games with James. So, there you have it. That was our episode on For Your Eyes Only. And we'll be back next episode with another greatest hits of Games with James. And James, you and I will be back soon to talk about Octopussy. Yeah, yeah. I've watched it recently as well, so I have a lot to say about that one. Well, you've rewatched it already? Yeah, I watched it. Oh, when I say recently, I mean like in March. But I, I had the urge, so I was like, you know what? I'm not going to wait for Bond Jam. I'm going to watch it now. Yeah, never wait for Bond Jam. Always watch Bond when your heart wants it. Desires, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things that's sort of a downside to the podcast is that I find myself thinking, oh, no, I can't watch that Bond movie. I'm in the mood for it, but I should wait because I'm going to have to yeah. watch it again soon. Um, but I yeah. gave into temptation, yeah. Yeah, always do, do. So until then, you can follow us and like and subscribe to us on all your preferred platforms, Bond Jam Cast on Instagram, X, Facebook, all the usual places. Quite quiet yeah. over there, but uh, you can comment. If you send us a message, you know, we'll send we'll us a message, but we will respond. Yeah, give us a five star rating or comment or something on Spotify or iTunes or wherever. <laughs> Make us look good. So, until next time, James. Don't forget to spread that jam. Spread that jam, everyone, and take care. Cheerio. Cheerio.